Recording, Recording is, is on. on. Interesting. So, uh, this is the first open uh, developer telecom for the Think Printer uh, ecosystem. So, um, yeah, there's a few of us because of uh, scheduling issues. We'll do better next time. Uh, we've had previously, for 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 your information, UK, uh, we've had um, semi-closed telecons between the main developers before, but we never really invited anybody uh, from the general public, let's say, uh, to join in. So we figured there's no reason to keep these meetings closed. Uh, and, and actually, since you've been coming in and, and trying to promote uh, or to, to develop new tools and new front new new interfaces uh it makes a lot of sense that you're uh here because then you can actually get feedback and we can we get to hear what you're trying to work with um so one of the things that uh, i just wanted to, to clarify and unfortunately there's none of us here and not enough of us here to, to really discuss this with the, the main people involved but uh the status of the release of umikaze 221 um, so Richard uh, has pushed the third release candidate for that. And we, I've seen uh, one or two issues on GitHub from somebody who's using it for a CNC machine that you're responding to, Richard. Is that correct? Yeah, I think the problem there is that uh, he's got configuration file issues. He said he posted local, but I didn't find it anywhere. And he hasn't gotten back to me on that. Uh, I think one of the things that's somewhat a concern is that because the uh, 2.2 doesn't directly uh, be backward compatible with the other one is that we, by, by copying them, the old ones, they're ending up introducing what are effectively errors that have to be corrected. But the way uh, redeem aborts and uh, you can't tell what's going on from Octoprint, uh, yeah. It makes a difficulty. I, I, in some respects, question whether it's even a good scheme at this point to do that, you know, other than just backing the, the files up and leaving them somewhere else and, mm -hmm. and then telling them to manually integrate. Yeah, that's probably a valid, uh, a valid point. Uh, instead of, uh, making them .cfg files, maybe we should just do .back, uh, .bak, so that if they want to port it, uh, they, they have to manually do it, especially coming from a 2.1 or a 2.0 uh, installation. That's probably a, that's probably a very good point. Um, I do have a bit to uh, interject, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, as I told you previously, I was interested um, in hearing your uh, your feedback as to uh, converting the current configuration schema from .cfg files to a .json file. And by doing that, we could actually version the .json file itself, which wouldn't be automatically updated to match the current version. And it would prompt the user to say like, hey, you have this configuration, it's from a previous version, and then give feedback as to what values, which fields have been changed. Uh, actually, with the current scheme, we can pretty much accomplish that. You'll find that uh, I introduced a, another section at the top of it, which has a configuration version on it, and uh, that would accomplish the same thing. This is true. I did notice that as well. My, I, I guess uh, where I'm coming from is more from a uh, UI, uh, UI experience point of view, it would just be easier to parse a JSON file as opposed to a dot, uh, .cfg file. So the the dot .cfg is a YAML file, uh, and um, we can, frankly, at this point, what what you're what looking at it from my perspective, you're both proposing similar changes in terms of versioning, and then what you're talking about um, is just changing the syntax from yaml to json effectively uh, yeah yeah and i don't have any strong objection to that i actually do think that it would make it easier to parse uh, in a number of things there's easier there's better tools and, and better known tools to actually automatically format json uh, files with the proper indents for, for readability 
Uh, so I think we would get in there because the YAML is notoriously tricky with indents. Uh, so that would definitely be an advantage, uh, but I don't, um, I don't think it's worth delaying the the release to include that change in. Whereas, Not at all. Uh, whereas what Richard is introducing in terms of version control and configuration, that may actually make sense to introduce um, into the release to actually get uh, to to actually prevent people from breaking redeem because of an old config. Uh, version. Agreed. I, I I hate delaying it more because it's been way too long since we've been working on this. But I think uh, you're right. We I haven't had time to actually think about the deployment of this before uh, and how it would affect users. Well, let me let me inject the other thing. The problem that I have with Jason is that you almost have to have a tool to edit it. Well, it's it's easily editable from any text editor. Uh, yeah, if you have it properly formatted and reformatted and stuff like that. I mean, I don't have any trouble doing it, but I worry about you know the really uh, novice type user in in terms of uh, being able to edit it. Well, in that aspect, um, I do have a uh, VS Code. Uh, uh, web interface that would be for the uh, the pro version of the uh, interface. So instead of going through the web UI, you could actually just go in and have syntax highlighting and syntax correcting with linting and everything. It's wait wait wait. Before we go deeper, I think we're we're talking about two different things. The the, the JSON that we're talking about is for the redeem configuration, right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, the YAML file right now, yes, it's easy to edit because it, it needs nothing more than a couple of spaces and the proper section headers. The advantage of JSON is uh, specifically the ease of parsing and that it doesn't care if it's a tab or a space and it, it doesn't care about indent levels. So it, it's a little bit more free form in terms of syntax at that level. At the same time, I understand Richard's concern. What I would suggest, though, is that we should, if we do try to move to JSON, what we can do is modify the uh, text editor for that's built into the plugin in Octoprint to actually uh, automatically format the the values. And and actually, this is something that we've been discussing for a while: is to transform the that editor into a kind of a table as to what values you set with a predefined button so that it gets added in the right section and you set that you only have like a free text field for the value but it does some validation in terms of oh you want to put a value here so let's make sure that you know what the unit is afterwards and if it's meant to be a number then i will not accept any characters which are common sources of typos that we've seen um, I guess I would say in that aspect, with the uh, UI that I'm working on, the mm -hmm. creator actually currently does that. It's not completely fleshed out, but it won't let the user input any invalid uh, values. Yep. yep. And, and unless, then, unless you're in pro mode. If you're in pro mode, then there is no uh, value like right. uh, assertion. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I, that's uh, That's a very... Uh, very good approach, and and so what you what you're developing is an interface that's basically to control redeem by removing octoprint as a layer completely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, basically, um, I looked into the octoprint API, and I really don't have any problems with using the API. And in fact, once this gets going, I I'm not really um uh, objecting to not uh, porting it to the Octoprint API as well. Um, the problem that I have is that the API seems somewhat bloated and convoluted for really what we need. Like the thing about Octoprint is that it's kind of like a jack of all trades, master of none. I really like, and it's fantastic. But I feel like the way that it's implemented, there's a lot of unnecessary things that you end up not using, but you're still paying the performance penalty for. I totally agree. Yeah, it's I, I, I agree as well. Uh, it's just that up until now, we didn't have anybody willing to put in the effort to a different interface. 
And it made more sense for us to focus on using Octoprint, assuming that Octoprint will get better and allow us to remove and cut out some of that bloat with uh, future versions. Um, unfortunately, we've noticed that uh, the efforts in that regard have been relatively slow on the Octoprint side of things. And especially because the main target for Octoprint seems to be running it on a Raspberry Pi 2, 3, uh, mm -hmm. which has a lot more horsepower, a lot more memory. It's not uh, as friendly towards uh, weaker systems like as it used to be anymore. And so as a result, the performance on a BeagleBone has degraded significantly over time. So um, I will. I, I would be all for it if you offer an, a, a valid alternative for Octoprint that we can actually ship. That would be perfect. Mm -hmm. At the moment, uh, because everybody's used to using Octoprint with it, and there's a lot of support around it, um, I, I think we'll we'll stick to to shipping Octoprint at least for this next release and probably for the initial release with the Revolve. Uh, and then, oh, yeah, we're as, as we go along. Other. Yeah, I mean, I look. I, I, I'm not saying that your effort. I'm just saying that as a general policy for the official images that we're going to release, we'll ship with Octoprint. Uh, what we can do is we can also list alternative images that ship with your interface instead, and just mark it as okay. This is what we're working on. We're hoping to be able to release it soon because it's more. Uh, specialized to, to interact with our ecosystem. Uh, however, it's still under development, so it's a development version of, uh, of, of the image and not a full, um, like, stable, supported release. Yeah, so, of course. I have no complaints in that regard. Yeah, at least at least an initial step. So uh, the, the other thing, too, is that Octoprint will be adding a few uh, modifications in the, the 1.4 uh, major release that that uh, Gina is planning, which will be to create plugins for the the uh, printer communication interface, uh, because at the moment a lot of the bloat that you're mentioning with the regex and the G code parsing and all the, these fail safes that's happening is because she's got only a single point of entry to any printer, and so she did, she does all sorts of stuff like firmware detection. Uh, G code validation and uh, handling multiple types of G codes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it just adds on to the the extra bloat that really we don't need uh, because we are one, once we can actually write our own plugin into how Octoprint is going to interact with Redeem, then all that's left of Octoprint is the REST API, uh, the web UI and the plugin the plugin system for anything else that we tack onto it which will be pretty much just the configuration wizard uh that i'd like to eventually develop for redeem and toggle and oh, that's already the, in the works on this one yeah well the, the, there's nobody actively working on a wizard uh for uh octoprint that i know of oh not for octoprint but i am doing a like a uh, initial setup wizard which oh, is okay. like a step-by-step -step walkthrough for like initially setting up the config printer. Oh, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. I, my, my only concern is that we not make our decisions based on this is what Octoprint wants to do, but rather just base, base it on the idea that we're going to have an interface out there doing it, whether it's Octoprint or the one he's developing or something else. I mean, hmm. uh, no, I, the guy that's I, working I, on CNC is... Uh, you know, he, he'd rather have something that looks like the gerbil control panel. Uh, yeah. And it just needs a pipe to be able to feed the controls in right now. And that would be better for him than even having Octoprint in the system because it doesn't accomplish anything for him. I, 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 I totally agree. Uh, all I'm saying is that uh, we need to, at the moment, the, the input of any commands into Octoprint, into Redeem, uh, was developed with the idea that Octoprint was the was the was going to be the input point, and so as a result, like the whole the whole communication layer has been built on that. But one thing that we do better than other projects is that uh, we've we've actually got proper object-oriented abstraction layers. That means that we can actually 
replace or develop an alternative endpoint, which will allow us to have multiple avenues of communication uh, to, st to stream the data and to redeem uh, concurrently, which uh, I'm not aware that it's as easy to do uh, with any other type of printer that's out there. So uh, all I'm saying is that right now, yes, we're stuck with the OctoPrint legacy uh, interface, I look forward to being able to actually write a more optimized and efficient version for Octoprint based on the 1.4 uh, uh, plugin for the communication uh, layer instead of having it uh, having having Octoprint force us to, to use just a serial pipe. Uh, but I'm not saying that what we develop will be exclusive to Octoprint uh, because whatever we develop as a uh, system to actually f control and feed data into Redeem and get and get status updates from Redeem. Uh, it's going to be generic, and then we just develop a plugin for Octoprint so that it can interface with Octoprint. But the the API needs to be properly documented so anybody can interface with it. Does Fair enough. Happen? Yeah, I agree. Uh, but there's really no reason that Toggle needs to talk to Octoprint to do most of what it does. That it can take a Data stream straight from Redeem. I I think that was the idea initially, uh, and then uh, unfortunately it became a lot easier to use Octoprint to actually do the back end of, of Toggle. So uh, what I would suggest is that until we have a different way than just the the serial pipe into re into Redeem from Octoprint, uh, we leave Toggle's control. We leave Toggle depending on Octoprint instead. Because that way you only have one avenue into Redeem. Because when you want to start a print, for example, uh, right now the way Toggle is doing it is it's selecting a file through Octoprint and telling Octoprint to start the the, the print of, of that file through uh, re and it's by sending the, the instructions to Redeem. Uh, Toggle does not have currently the backend to be able to list files uh, from Redeem. And then send the sends direct G code commands to redeem. It it does it simply doesn't have that cap that capability yet. But so, but the fundamental capability is you send an M twenty type command or something, I, and, I, I agree. and redeem I, I, does all the work anyway. Yes, but Toggle does not have any. Uh, uh, support for the serial G code. Uh, interface currently. It only has the WebSock client to, to get status updates from Octoprint, and it has a REST endpoint, uh, uh, a REST uh, API to be able to send commands to Octoprint through the REST API, through the REST endpoints that it exposes. Redeem doesn't expose either a, 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 sock, a, um, a WebSocket or a REST API for a toggle to hook up into. So what I'm saying is we need no, it, development no, it, there. It, it, no, it exposes a pipe. That you can send commands down. Uh, toggle does not expose a pipe. Yes, toggle but, doesn't know how to use a pipe. No, to Toggle doesn't know how right. to use it because it's chosen to go through Octoprint, but it, exactly. yeah. it could send those commands directly down the pipe into Redeem. Yeah. Yes, and that's and, and so what I'm saying is that until we have a proper way, because it, we, we've had we've, we've had discussions, and I think we agree on this: is that the um, the fact that we have only a serial, a single serial port that does uh, flow control, status updates, and uh, path the data input for Redeem is a problem in terms of having proper real time communication and uh, speed of communication as well. We we know we've got a performance impact when we've got uh, very detailed models. Uh, that that have a lot of small segments, but I'm not I'm not proposing that we use that kind of interface for toggle to send the contents of the file right. to us, but simply send the one one command to redeem, which says print this file that's already in your storage. Yeah, I no, I I understand that, uh, and the the. the what I'm saying is that Toggle currently is set up so that it, it depends on Octoprint. And I would prefer that we develop the uh, proper communication interface for Redeem first and then modify Toggle once we have the specs down. 
Um, out of curiosity, um, could we not just build a uh, abstract interface that could basically proxy any backend that we wanted to, to like make it generic as to which uh, w which protocol we would be using? Does that make any sense? Well, ba basically, you want you want to put an adapter in in every uh, line of flow, which you effectively already have. I mean, there, there's no reason why, particularly since everything's written in Python the way it is, uh, you can't have one of them that's speaking Marlin G code and another one is speaking some other language or whatever. Uh, well, no, I don't. I don't mean no, the no, uh, saying, flavor. No, I'm just saying. No, I'm just saying you you just have the plug in there, and the same thing's true uh, about status information. That uh, uh, whether we send it out over a, a web web interface to toggle, or we send the same data straight over a pipe as a set of events, uh, toggle, toggle could accept them just as well in, in that format, and we're already doing it uh, because we're. We're being we're being polled by Octoprint to send us what the current temperature is, and then it gets it and it relays it on the toggle, and we could just have toggle say, you know, send send me regular updates of temperature. And, no, I, and, and absolutely, we can absolutely. open as many we can open as many pipes as we need to toggle, which is two basically. Here's the data coming out, and you send in these little short commands. Uh, to start a print or jog or you know whatever they are, but they're all basically one one line or, or two line uh, G code commands. I, Richard, I, I completely agree with this. Uh, all I'm saying is that uh, the, the the API, the the language, the the way that you're going to send these <coughs> communications and back and forth. It's the way I see it is it's going to be a subset of whatever uh, proper communication uh, channels and and uh, language we put in place for Redeem to be controlled by any system, not just Toggle, but also Octoprint or uh, Dante's uh, newborn system as well, where we're going to have. The, these various pipes that, or the, the, that basically have the different f data flows going in and out. Uh, I want us to define those first, maybe test it out with Octoprint uh, to see that we actually validate the development there and we have, and then we can actually have toggle shift over and use those directly. Um, I, I just don't want to, have to, to, to spread our efforts too early because we know we have limited power to do this. So uh, that, that's, that, that's my only concern on this. Fair enough. Uh, and, and the other advantage, at least for, for me as well, to, because I keep, convince, I, I keep trying to convince uh, Elias to make bigger batches of his hardware, uh, which it's a little bit difficult. But my, point, my, my, my thinking is that toggle, depending on Octoprint, means that technically it's completely independent of Redeem, which means somebody that has a Marlin printer could potentially buy a manga screen, hook it up to a Raspberry, put toggle on it, and voila, he's got a he's got like a, a touch screen uh, on his printer without having a replicate or a revolve. But he still has toggle, so he's buying a manga screen and he's got a, a Raspberry underneath. Well, and that's so, just good abstraction, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just the it, it's uh, Octoprint is. Unfortunately, one of the most popular printer controllers out there at the moment. Uh, to not support it uh, at the moment would be foolish in our part, I think, simply because there's a lot of people who are very familiar with it. I'm not saying it should be the only one. I'm all for offering alternatives or developing a more integrated, uh, even a fork of Octoprint where we take out the trash, basically. But uh, hopefully- It's more so the industry standard at this point. So exactly. we should support it. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So, support, I agree. Uh, being dependent on it is what I don't agree with. I, I, I agree with you there as well. But yeah, I, I, I get where he's I, coming from, though. Right now, that's not really possible because there's not much of an alternative route right now. I don't know. I can, I can control it pretty well from uh, my... Uh, 
um, a Mac laptop uh, through uh, existing Rapidier host. Sure, sure. You can, you, you, there's, there's absolutely nothing that stops us from doing that. Um, however, uh, the, the whole premise of the marketing argument that, that Elias built the replicate around was that, hey, look, if, you, if you're used to having a Marlin with a Raspberry with Octoprint, well, guess what? You get, all, you get it all in one. And you don't have to worry about keeping your computer, your laptop open. You can just like unplug and go away. Uh, I'm not saying that it's not good to have the alternative. The fact that you get there, that you're able to, to use your pipe directly from uh, for a peer host, or I, I guess I could use Simplify 3D for the same thing. But the 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 point is that it's not the main. It was it it wasn't the main design goal to do that. The idea was to have a self-contained unit that was uh, offering you the, the possibility to interact with it through a simple web browser to upload your to upload your design and then the printer does the rest. That was the that was the initial objective, and uh, I think we're with Octoprint and the uh, we're moving in that direction. Uh, we've already taken a step back from what uh, Elias initially wanted because we've removed the slicers that were on board. Uh, and uh, Elias wasn't specifically happy about that because he uses this, the onboard slicer all the time. But that's just because he's lazy. Uh, but, but I mean, there are that people point, that have that it's still workflow. installable, right? You, you can always been, add it in. You can, uh, but to be honest, I haven't tested this in over a year. So <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, it's, it's theoretically possible, yes. Uh, how you actually do it, I would say that the scripts that install it currently in the in the repository probably are not going to do it well. Uh, if you're willing to tinker around, you'll get it working. <laughs> okay. uh, but th this follows basically. I, I when we had the the Google Plus community, I, I was doing frequent polls, and we found out oh, well, people aren't just aren't slicing on the board. Uh, part of I mean, that I, I think is because it was the Cura engine was just way too old. And uh, I didn't uh, like having to futz around with compiling Slicer every time I wanted to distribute it for a new image. So, um, yeah, we stopped because it was just too much effort. It took up a lot of valuable disk space on the on the BeagleBone, and uh, people weren't using it. So, I mean, yeah. maybe going forward, we could set up some type of uh, deployment pipeline that would auto compile the the lead level and compile it into a into the actual image that so 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 my objective with this is to actually have a system where uh, we actually provide like a script where uh, if people want to install slicer uh, on the beaglebone then we provide them like a very simple script that's going to just download a pre-compiled binary that we put up somewhere on a repository but even it then it locally that's kind of where I was coming from before when I was saying like maybe we should just have like a redeem specific PPA, like for things like just we, a, we do a, actually like a we, we have and, so, so we don't have a PPA but we do have a proper um, baby uh, a proper DB uh, repository file right. and that that is in place and we actually use it for to for toggle dependencies, um, but uh, I. We simply haven't. I, I simply haven't gotten around to actually compiling the later versions of Slicer for uh, the ARM architecture uh, to include it. Basically, well, it's, I'm it's just that simple. Up like a build pipeline to do it automatically. Like that. That's not really because I have like a, a couple Kubernetes like instances running on the cloud. I could use mm -hmm. some spare CPU power to just you know. Uh, watch for get changes and compile the latest version and package it up as a dev. The the big the big problem with doing that is uh, the question of whether or not it uh, it's been verified in integration. Yeah, uh, that's well. We idea. could, if you guys are familiar, I do have a Spinnaker instance set up which can do integration testing as long as we write the actual scripts for it. That might be worth investigating. Uh, at the moment, uh, I, I want to say we're, we still need to finish up the uh, the two two one release, uh, which will not have slicers built in. 
Uh, uh, I would prefer being able to just provide a, a bash script where it's just like a basically a curl and an unzip into a specific folder, maybe some seds to add the the proper file paths to the slicer and octoprint configs, and 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 just leave it at that for, for at least for at least initially, and then move on to something a little bit more. Uh, robust and proper but at the moment the demand simply hasn't been there fair enough um, so um yeah the other thing too that we're still working on is or that andrew actually is, is working on most is the port of redeem for the revolve board um so uh i know from my interactions with him and uh, i stopped i stopped by to see elias uh, in oslo uh last weekend on the actually on tuesday i was flying home from vacation and uh it seems like um there was a slight flaw in the in the pre-series of revolve boards that he received where one of the resistors that was meant to be a one kilo ohm turned out to be a hundred kilo ohms which uh, in turn means that the the power uh, circuit was uh, heating up a lot more than it was designed to um, so it was reaching 105 degrees celsius running Jeez. 10 amps instead of uh running you know without a fan on and by what was it for the uh, voltage divider or something it, yeah it's a voltage divider on the pmos that was wrong it's like uh not even a, it's not even a voltage divider it's a, a it's a drop down for the for the gate okay fair enough and uh yeah the the fact that the voltage was too low means that it was basically heating up way too much for some reason and so um he replaced it on on his boards uh, in his office, and basically he's now able to run 16 amps continuously with uh, with active cooling on the board. It's still not enough, and he knows what's going on is basically the the copper uh, um, diffusion surface underneath the, the the chips are are basically too small. So he's redesigning the layout a little bit to, to accomplish that. Okay, so he's increasing the copper weight to handle more current. Uh, not to handle more current, to diffuse the heat, because basically, uh, and I'll, I'll show you on my prototype, uh, I don't know if you'll see it very well. The, uh, you remember the replicate had a fuse on the input, so this is the, this is the input here. Right. And, uh, in, instead of having a fuse, he's got two, uh, PMOS, uh, chips right here, right in my, right in my, my finger is. So right. These are tiny, uh, but they can handle a lot of current. The problem is that they diffuse a lot of heat. Right. So what's happening is that uh, kind of like for the stepper drivers, we've got these these copper pads underneath. There's a copper on the second layer, so it's a it's a four layer PCB, so two top, two bottom uh, from the fiberglass, and on the second layer underneath those PMOSs, there's no uh, there's not enough uh, surface area to really diffuse the heat through the board. And so what he's doing is he's he's making that area bigger to diffuse the heat that's generated, uh, so that the so that the the chip actually stays cool. Okay, okay. fair enough. Um, I guess built in heat sink. In in that sense as well, um, at least with my uh, my uh, B three A, I ended up having to throw a bunch of heat sinks on it to uh, support the uh, output because I run my motors pretty hot with high amperage. I have my reasons, but it's mostly testing. Um, with the new Revolve board, how how exactly do you guys envision the cooling so solutions to be on that? Uh, much like the Replicate, except it'll be simplified. Uh, I noticed I, I mentioned earlier these little copper pads. So on the Replicate, right. technically the heating that these are these are basically like through pads to straight, like just plain straight copper. Uh, with heat pipes to bring the the heat down from the driver, mm -hmm. and so um, ideal cooling on the replicate is the same thing, where you've got you put your heat sinks on on the copper pads on the bottom, and then you run a fan through between the beagle bone and the uh, and the and the replicate. Now, because it's a small sandwich with a cape, it's it's very difficult to to actually get heat sinks small enough and uh, avoid short circuits. And also get the airflow you need through there because of the Ethernet port at the end. So uh, this is simplified now that you've got only a single uh, PCB layer. 
but even then even if you only put them on the top you you, st you still just need to put like the same the same heat sinks that you had on the replicate if you just you put them on top and that's it <coughs> okay yeah um, so i'm i i, I don't think that's going to i'm not worried about the driver situation in terms of heat the the power circuit though is a problem because right now we cannot run more than 16 amps in the in the A3 boards. Um, so he's, uh, I think, I, I think it's going to be the A4 version that's uh, probably going to make it to production. Well, how and, how many amps are you guys trying to push at peak? Well, so the the replicate was able to handle 20 amps right through the fuse. Yeah, we had a 20 amp fuse. Yeah. yeah, and now on this board we've got an extra stepper. We've got two extra heaters. Um, or one extra heater, I don't remember. One extra heater. And so uh, we want to be able to actually push more, uh, more at, at least 20 amps, uh, if not more. That the, the baseline is to keep the specs of the replicate and potentially, and potentially improve on them. Okay. I am looking forward to this new board. Yeah, it's going to be, it's definitely going to be a, a very good uh, setup. Uh, what's very cool is that it doesn't have the micro HDMI, it's got a full size HDMI port and it's got four USBs on board. So you don't have to worry about having the, uh, having a USB hub now, uh, which was the, uh, sometimes a source of frustration with the bigger bones for a lot of people. Yeah, that brings me to my next question. Uh, to my knowledge, the uh, original replicate, well, not replicate, but the original BeagleBone, did it support 2.0 or 3.0? I'm pretty sure it was 2.0. 2.0, yeah. Um, with the uh, newer board, does it support 3.0 or is it still 2.0? No, it's still 2.0. Uh, part of that is because the sock for the Revolve and the BeagleBone is the same. And the... Uh, the USB hub, the, the USB point, if you will, <coughs> is built into the sock, and it's uh, it's specced at uh, USB two and not USB three. Okay. However, it should give us a uh, slightly better. Uh, oh, hi, Richard! I didn't realize we uh, lost you. I don't know. Uh, suddenly, my screen closed. Now I may be on here twice. <laughs> yeah, you are. Yeah, I see you twice. Uh, let me kick out the old you. Okay. So okay, now, okay. Now there's only three of us. Again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you confused the students the other day when you were on the video and also on your telephone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know I did, but I it, I was I was getting much better audio through my phone than I was on the video. Yeah, I no, I understand, but <laughs> yeah. No, it, it, they they got a little confused at the meeting. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, so the Revolve, uh, from what I understand, there's some discussion still between Andrew and uh, Elias as to how to uh, control the stepper driver modes for the 2130s, um, uh, because some of the pins that, uh, or, or some of the, the, the controls that Andrew is trying to, to use to set the modes on the 2130s is not working the way he wanted it to and looking at it apparently the pins are not wired on the revolve but he's, uh, he's uh, surprised and so he's talking with elias to try and figure out a, a proper way of, of resolving that um uh, just out of curiosity to my understanding with the uh newer tsmc's the uh modes are controlled via uart are they not you have the choice between uart and spi Right, but I assume we would be using UART, not SPI. Uh, to be honest, I don't know. Uh, I, I haven't been involved on that end of it uh, because the, the 2100s that we have in the replicate were controlled through a PWM uh, control for all of them at once. Right. And uh, for, th or is it, I don't remember. Anyway, and for the 2130s on the uh, Revolve, I think they're wired with SPI, but I could be wrong. Okay. Because uh, I don't think the 2100 support SPI. So, uh, no, they don't. I don't know. No, the, the I, I, B3A I, I, doesn't support SPI, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
No, I, I'd have to look more in depth on the on the specs of the trinamic drivers and and on the schematics that Elias has put together. Uh, but I I honestly don't know. Fair enough. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, I'm I'm hoping to be able to get starting to to work on the uh, on the image flashing for the the, the revolve as soon as we get the two two one image out. That's that's my plan. Um, to that point, how different would the because uh, uh, I believe I had brought this up in the uh, Slack channel not so long ago with um. I was saying that I was gonna pick up one of the uh, BeagleBone wireless, uh, BeagleBone yeah. Black wireless, uh, just because it had a similar processor or the same processor. Um, yeah. How different would the uh, build or flash procedure be for the Revolve versus the current B3A board? Uh, so in terms of image, the same Linux image will work, right? So if you take a BeagleBone Black image and put it on the Revolve, it'll work. Okay. The flashing is different because the Revolve does not have an SD card slot. So okay. you have a different U-boot on the board, and it's going to flash from a USB key, which should also make life easier for a lot of people because it'll be more accessible to run a, a, a USB extension cord than it is to have to basically dig their board out from under the, the printer to put in a, a micro SD. Okay. So um, what I want to try and do also, uh, this is once this is something once I actually have a flasher for the Ruval working, I want to see if we can actually make it work on the replicate. Because if we can, then that means that uh, we can release a USB key image instead of a micro SD, and that'll make a lot of people happy. Yeah, that seems really dope. It see, it seems to me that uh, what we need to do is, in some way, have a basically. A resident kernel booter, and it should work for both of them. That yeah. uh, it should be the U boot, basically. If you if you have a or the not the well, you you might you might have to have an init RAM to go with it to uh, actually yeah. process it. But uh, I mean, that's right. all you need. Yeah, I mean, if you have a U-boot that's, that's configured to look up uh, any disks on USB and try to flash from there and falls back onto looking for an SD card, then that means that you can flash a BeagleBone from the USB as well. Well, yeah, I mean, as long as the boot partition is flagged properly, then I don't see why that wouldn't be possible. No, exactly. Uh, so, but the, the, the thing is that the U-boot on uh, and the bootloader on the BeagleBone, uh, by default searches on the SD card and I don't think it searches on the USB at all. So I think we may need to modify the U-boot that's flashed onto BeagleBones first. Yeah, unfor unfortunately with the way they're not handling the Cape Manager and stuff like that, it starts becoming complex if we're trying to modify it on top of these modifications on top of those modifications. Uh, the other The other approach is to just directly boot into a very small image, which is nothing but a flasher uh, image. You know, I mean, it's, it's I, a I see what you mean. Ultra, kind of a kind of a ultra, live CD ultra type minimal, of situation. An ultra minimal system that can can flash the other one and transfer to it. Yeah, um, like a live CD install, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's also a possibility. We'll have to explore that a little bit. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll start playing with it. I, uh, yeah, I first want to validate that we can actually get the RC3 properly flashing and working. I haven't heard any bug reports except for the one guy that's doing this CNC stuff. Uh, and, and we know that that's a config problem. Um, or we think at least, but I haven't seen anybody else that's using it that has had any issue with RC3. I've so, been running RC3 for since it's been out. I don't have any problems. Okay, so I think we're pretty close to a a, um, a gold master, Richard. Yeah, I, hope, I, I think I think the main thing we're missing is whatever we need to do in the documentation side of stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think I agree with you on that. Um, so I think what I'll do is uh, I'll um, I'll start writing up documentation. I th I'll find the wiki page and I'll share it in the development channel on the, on Slack and also put it in the forum. Uh, and uh, I'll also try and and revamp because the the the, thing, the wiki page that we have for for Umikaze is frankly uh too long to be helpful uh I want, i'm going to try and i'm going to try something new and break up uh, the pages into multiple sections for the 221 uh page and see if i can make it easier to find your way okay uh, let me, for, let me, for, for a new user to come in and, and let find me, their, let find me the, make the, a, a suggestion there are all kinds of things floating around here there and yonder and mm -hmm. to the extent that we can get into any of them and mark them as deprecated and uh, refer them to whatever the current one is would be a good thing. Yeah, that's I need to I need to be a little bit more methodical about that, uh, and that includes also the uh, GitHub wiki. We need to also remove all the Bitbucket links from all the pages on the wiki. Um, was it was it you Yuki who had the issue with uh, looking at the the Bitbucket repo repo instead of GitHub at some point? Um. Well, I did have that issue, but I was not the person who posted that. Um. That oh, was okay, a yeah, different. Yeah. 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 But you were looking. But it I, is I confusing. You, you had an issue with the wiki, though. You were where you were looking at the GitHub wiki page instead of the uh, Think Printer wiki. Uh, that is possible. Yeah. There, yeah. There's a lot of things scattered along. And then once you do like a search yeah. query for yeah, it, yeah. you get like multiple result, uh, results. And then, yeah, it is yeah. somewhat convoluted. Also, uh, why is the Bitbucket uh, repo even still like, why isn't it nuked yet? Uh, that we'll have to ask Elias. He's the one who has control over it. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll ping him on that. Uh, if not today, at least tomorrow. And, yeah, uh, fair we'll enough. That. Or, at, or at least to, to put like a big really like deprecated move to GitHub. I think there is something along those lines. The problem comes when um, there's old wiki articles that refer you to Bitbucket, and then yeah. there's like there's new uh, new repos that also refer to like archaic data, which is like. Mm. When, you're, when you're looking for a specific type of information. Well, and, yeah. then, and then you get the search engines that uh, you know, just skip you past that uh, deprecation <laughs> notice uh, down into the middle of something. Yeah. yeah. So Okay, so action points for me are to, to try and get Elias to mute the Bitbucket, uh, go through the documentation, and uh, make sure that we all the scattered pieces at least direct users to one single point and if possible centralize the documentation and, and unify it in, a, in some way um, it's not going to happen instantly but yeah. uh, I, I think Richard we can probably uh, I'll, I'll create a Google Doc and we can actually start writing down just the basic release notes for the users who are just upgrading the system and then uh, worry about upgrading the wiki and, uh, and centralizing the documentation as we go along uh, later. How does that sound? Uh, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. The main thing I've been working on most recently is uh, bringing a virtual environment wrapper mm -hmm. in, in as part of things. First of all, it makes the installs a lot shorter. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, secondly, you know, maybe we can get Andrew and people like that to start doing things properly in an environment <laughs> rather than... <laughs> <laughs> I, I I would I would agree with that, and I know that I still have trouble uh, using the Python virtual environment tools uh, myself. So, uh, yeah, I I would welcome proper documentation on how to use them. So, yeah, um, this is oh continue. No, I'm, I'm uh, that's it. <laughs> oh no, I had a question because um. I was actually trying to set up um, some uh, BeagleBone Black uh, emulization the other day. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, resources that we have available on how to configure that? You uh, mean running a virtual? Uh, well, ARM basically API emulating the, the ARM V8 uh, processor and just running the image natively. Well, emulated, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, so I I managed at some point to do it with QMU, and I think I had some links about that. 
Yeah, uh, I got the QMU links. Yeah, and uh, I, I managed to do it. The problem is that with the limitations of QMU, you were limited. I was limited either I had the right processor, but I didn't have enough RAM, or I had an issue with uh, the what the storage uh, disk looked like. And so it, it was... It was running, it was slow, and it wasn't particularly efficient. Uh, and so uh, as a result, I think what uh, Richard and Andrew are doing to, to actually build the images from an ARMHF uh, architecture machine is they, they actually have an Odroid uh, or um, now... Uh, yeah. Is it, he's got these guys. Odroid. Uh, yeah, you've got an Odroid, but Andrew has a different machine. I forget the name of it, uh, got a which is one. also... Yeah, he's... Yeah, it's not an Odroid, it's a different brand. Um, in any case, it, uh, basically it's a souped-up ARM uh, machine that runs a, a CH root and, a, and, and, and builds the image in that. Oh, okay. Um, and so that's how we build the images. And, of course, the only way to properly test the integration is to, is to boot it up on a replicate uh, or a revolve. Right. Uh, because in any case, even if you manage to run uh, Umikaze on a BeagleBone without a replicate attached, you'll not be able to start redeem and validate that the, the integration, let's say, of the full stack is, is properly set up. Yeah, that's kind of where I was coming from uh, because I was uh, focusing on uh, getting the uh, USB so that I can communicate, start doing uh, some com communication between the uh, front end and the uh, actual server and redeem service itself. So I was trying to figure out a more efficient way to do that instead of like copy and pasting or like SH, uh, instead of like uh, S uh, FTPing like the files over and restarting the service and everything. Yeah, I can understand the frustration there. Um... Yeah, I don't don't have a way at the moment of starting redeem with like a virtual cape attached that I know of. That may be a, a future a future development item, or because uh, it would make development easier because then you could potentially even run redeem even like on your desktop as a as a uh, just as a service while you develop your your tool in whatever JavaScript, Python, or other language. Um, and redeem would just be like, okay, I'll just like, I'll just act like a dummy. Uh, I won't try to interface with the hardware. I'll just give you values back and and run with just in dummy values. Well, that uh, that's one one step of it. The other step of it is to have a virtual machine that instead of talking to real steppers, it talks to a stepper em emulation that says, oh, you told me to step one. Well, I'll change my counter from seven to eight. And, uh, you know, oh, yeah. oh yeah. hey, you ran into an end stop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that's uh, definitely something worth trying uh, at the moment, though. That's uh, a lot more work than I have the time for. <laughs> well, to be, that's probably more work than it's worth right now, regardless. Oh, well, right right now it is, but uh, in in the long run, it can really be uh, useful uh, as we refactor all of this stuff to just have not not only the real steppers, but mm -hmm. you have you have an API to a stepper in a sense that uh, so so we can put a pseudo stepper behind it. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, and, and there may be more than one application for that because I can completely envision that uh, somebody may have a Revolve or a Replicate and for some reason they decide to uh, use, for example, the Revolve has two external header uh, drivers and you've got, so that means you've got like, is it 10, 20 pins that you could potentially reallocate and rewire. So you could potentially say, hey, I'm going to use that to communicate with a servo, and I'm going to reconfigure those pins to be something else. We've got an SPI port. We've got a UART port. You could hook up some some other stuff that you want to deal with real time on there, um, and like this, like proper servo motors, and just use that. Basically, abstracting the the, the stepper motor. Uh, just telling it, okay, I want it to go to that position, and then you can use a stepper or a servo or whatever else you want to, to actually achieve that. So yeah, I, I think awesome. that, that that's, 
it's a long it's a long running objective, but it's uh, it's also a vision that I agree with in terms of doing that. I'm just uh, yeah. We'll have to see how soon uh, that that gets people interested. The Revolve, I think, needs to have a solid software platform running, and I think the the two two one release uh, is going to be a very good platform to base ourselves off of, at least to get initial customers working. So the the, the documentation we effort we put into two two one will pay off when we get the the Revolve released and the influx of new users that that's going to bring. Because we're talking like thousands of people suddenly joining the system. We need them. <laughs> yeah, yes, we do. To that as well. We do. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have to realize that probably 1% or half a percent of those are going to be people who are somewhat knowledgeable about code <laughs> and Linux in general. Well, that also kind of is why I'm working on the UI so yeah. just to make it a bit more streamlined. Well, I, I definitely appreciate your effort. Uh, yeah, I'm trying, man. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I like um, like I said, the, the final design for the Revolve is not ready yet for mass production. So that's probably going to be what well, the design is probably going to finalize. I want to say in May or June at the earliest. I, I, I honestly don't know. There's, there's a lot of stuff that Elias still has to finish on the hardware. He told me he's working on a, on a video update that he's going to send out when it's ready. Uh, so that should be another week or so before we see that. And he's going to detail kind of the work that's that's ongoing. Um, but he he wants to get it out as soon as possible. So that's uh, that's the good news. Yeah, that sounds great. I just, I mean, me personally, like everything that's come out of. Uh, either through uh, you guys on the Devon or Elias on like the uh, actual hardware and like things have been very good quality and I just want to see it stay that way. I think that's one of the one of the most paramount things that really brought me into this was just the quality of the board, the quality of the environment, the fact that it was Unix based, all of these things are what really like drew me in. So I wanted to keep going that way. Yeah, I think I think we all agree on wanting to keep it that way, right? I mean, the, there's we're we're here because we 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 believe in the concept, not because we want to tear it down. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, I I think we're running out of uh, decent progress of anything here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think uh, at least we've, we've touched on a number of topics and uh, we've got some action points coming up. So um, maybe Richard, if you can make the, the gold master commit and uh, start preparing the, the actual release, I'll, I'll set up the document so we can both work on the release notes. And uh, for people who have been using RC3, we'll, we'll ask them to review the, the release notes before we actually publish, the, publish them on the release. Um, just so we make sure that we cover everything that's that's been going on. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't know that there's anything to do uh, to create a gold master except get the documentation into it and uh, uh, drop another tag. <laughs> yeah, basically, uh, I I think I agree with that. Uh, given the given the lack of issues coming up with with RC three, so uh, yeah, we just need to make sure that we get it out. So I'll, uh, luckily, I've still got tomorrow without my girlfriend uh, before she comes back from well, that's Norway lucky. as well. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good use of my time, and the weather's been, well, wet. So that means that my flying toys are staying inside. <laughs> so, okay. Um, great. So uh, I'll stop the recording if I can, and we'll consider this a finished uh uh, thank you for joining, and hopefully there will be more of us next time, and I'll try to have a, a little bit more uh, prepared of an agenda. I had some, some rough ideas of what to discuss, and we covered most of it. So, Thanks. Okay.